Locked up. Winter vacation had started and we children all stayed at home. At 11 o'clock one night, mom and dad were still in the bathroom where they had been talking ever since dad had come home from work. Ji Yang and Ji Yun were asleep and grandma was in bed reading the newspaper. I was trying to finish Jane Eyre. Someone knocked softly on the door. I listened and it, and it came again. Two soft taps followed by a whispered, Lao Jiang, Lao Jiang. Only dad's friends from theater called him that. Who is it? I walked to the door and called quietly. It's me, Fan Wen Chong. I opened the door, happy to see him. Uncle Fan, it's so late. Oh my. I stopped when I saw his face. It was swollen, bruised, and bloody. Standing in the doorway, he looked like a monster. He swayed back and forth weakly, and as I stared, his face crumpled into tears. I turned away and ran to my bed. The whole family was startled by my cry. Grandma was trembling as she got out of bed and pulled him into the bathroom to wash his bruises. Ji Yang and Ji Yun huddled together at the bathroom door while mom and dad went downstairs to bring his bicycle into the building before the neighbors could see it. I huddled on the corner of a bed, not wanting to look at him again, not wanting to see his humiliation. I thought of his expressive face, handsome and vigorous. I remembered his huge success in many shows, the flowers, the admirers. His students and other actors used to defer to him so respectfully. Where was his dignity and authority now? Where was Uncle Fan? I curled up as if I was the only one being showered, being showered with blows. Come on, get back into bed. Children shouldn't be so nosy. Grandma dragged Jiang Ji Ji and Jiun back into the room. Grandma, how's Uncle Fan? I whispered. He's all right. She looked very tired. You go to sleep now. Don't mention this to anyone, anyone at all, understand? Grandma tucked our quilts around us, then turned out the light and went back to the bathroom. The frequent tossing and turning told me that no one had gone back to sleep. Jiwei, Uncle Fan groaned when Grandma washed his face. Jian broke the silence. His hands were shaking, Ji Yang said after a while. Grandma told you to go to sleep and not be so nosy. Why don't you just shut up? I don't know why I was suddenly so angry. Lying in the darkness, I could hear the faint voices in the bathroom. I tried to close my eyes, but when I did, all I could see was Uncle Fan's deformed face. Suddenly, the voices in the bathroom grew, grew louder. I held my breath and listened closely. That's nonsense. How could you do that? Dad said. You know, they use psychological pressure. That doesn't mean you should make up a story about something you never did. Dad's voice grew louder still. So what if I never listen to a foreign radio broadcast? They'll stop beating me if I confess to it, won't they? Leniency to those who confess and severity to those who resist. Look at my face, Lao Jiang. I can't stand it anymore. The voice trailed off and I thought I heard sobbing. I pulled my quilt over my head and tried to block out the sounds. This was not my Uncle Fan. Uncle Fan would not listen to foreign broadcasts or worry about psychological pressure. Most of all, I knew that my Uncle Fan would never cry. I began crying to myself under the quilt. I did not know why. Three days after he had come to our house, Uncle Fan had been detained. Since then, every evening, Mom and Grandma had fidgeted, going into the kitchen on the landing, finding something to do on the roof, unable to relax as they waited for Dad to come home. It was getting darker and darker. Ji Yun sat under the light doing her math homework. I worked on the sweater I was knitting for dad, sharing the sofa with Ji Yang, who was, intent, who was intent on making a periscope. My fingers moved mechanically. My mind was far away from what I was doing. I had just read an article in the paper. It told of a historical counter-revolutionary who, was, as a local official before liberation, had killed two communist guerrillas. The paper explained that because he had confessed and he had a positive attitude, he was pardoned. Meanwhile, act, an active counter-revolutionary was convicted of slandering Red Guards. He refused to confess and was imprisoned. So this was their policy of psychological pressure. No wonder Uncle Fawn thought he should confess to something he had not done. Had he confessed to listening to foreign radio broadcast, to foreign broadcasts? If he had, why hadn't he been treated with leniency? Why had he been detained? I could not figure it out. Finally, we heard steps on the stairs. We all held our breaths while we watched the door. It opened and there was dad. I looked at his face, body and legs, no bruises. We all sighed with relief. I can't take it anymore. Today at the meeting, they were obviously referring to me. As soon as he walked in the door, dad started talking excitedly and nervously to mom and grandma, not even caring that we children were listening. They stressed again and again that they had already had enough information and they would give the person one last chance to confess. If he continued to hold back, they would have to name him publicly and he would lose his chance at leniency. 
The adults went into the bathroom together and closed the door, but we could still hear them talking. Well, do you want to confess them? Then it might be better than being punished. Grandma voice, Grandma's voice sounded unusually old, but I have no idea what they want me to confess. After a pause, mom's voice had said, how about leaving the party? Dad cut her short. No, I did nothing wrong. How can I confess? I stopped knitting and looked up in alarm. Leaving the party? What was that? Ji Yang and Ji Yun had tilted their heads to hear better. What about Fan Wen Chong coming to our house, mom asked. He might have confessed he visited us. Maybe that's what they meant when they said that they already had the information. They could say that we were establishing counter-revolutionary ties. Of course you won't mention that. That would be betraying a friend. Grandma was firm. We promise not to tell anyone. Wen Chong has been a friend for over 30 years and he certainly won't say anything. We won't say anything either. But what if the theater decides to punish him? Mom asked. There was no answer. I could hear dad pacing around the room and I could smell the cigarette smoke coming through the crack under the door. I started to knit again. It was the same story day after day. Restlessness, anxiety, the adults' arguments. It was nearly Chinese New Year and no one even mentioned it. I wanted to know what was going on, but I was afraid to hear any more bad news. Suddenly I wished I could live at school. Then I could forget what was really, what was happening and I could laugh again. I wish that I had been born into a trouble-free family. Very early on Chinese New Year's morning, my grandma shook me awake. She was in tears. Your dad never came home last night. He's been locked up. Grandma laid her head on my pillow and continued to weep. I stared at my grandma's face and my fingers tightened on the sleeve of my pajamas. He had not come come home for the New Year's Eve dinner, though we had waited, though we had waited till until ten o'clock. We had gone to bed hoping that he would come later. He knew he would be detained detained sooner or later. He told me not to worry too much. Grandma's voice was steady, but her tears kept dropping on my hand. Now I began crying too. Why Ji Young was awake too? What did they lock him up for? I have no idea. I'm sure your father hasn't done anything wrong. Grandma said. Mom's weak voice was calling me. I jumped out of bed, threw on my padded coat, and ran over to her. Dad's side of the quilt was untouched and the pillow was smooth. Mom lay in bed with her eyes tightly shut, her face a waxy yellow. I knew what that meant. She was having an attack of Meniere's disease. She had had it for many years, and an attack could come on at any time. The world would spin around her, and she would feel weak and nauseous. Even opening her eyes would, would, would make her helplessly dizzy. How are you feeling, Mom? I gently stroked the hand that was outside the quilt. Would you like some soy milk? I'll tell Ji Yang to go buy some. No, no. I want you to give your Uncle Tian a call. He might know what happened to your dad. Mom fumbled under the pillow for her address book and handed to me. A little before seven, I bundled up and dashed out into the cold. In other years on New Year's morning, the streets would be littered with shreds of colored firecracker paper. Soon after breakfast, people loaded with gifts would begin to stream out of their homes to wish friends and relatives a happy new year. This year firecrackers were four olds and the, peop- and the few people who were in the mood to celebrate and few people were in the mood to celebrate. Streets were so quiet that the city, that the city seemed almost deserted. Following mom's instructions, I went to, the te- went to a telephone kiosk a few blocks from our alley so that the neighbors would, would not overhear me asking about dad. I waited shivering for the workers in Uncle Tian's kiosk to fetch him. Uncle Tian, it's me, Ji Wee. I said eagerly as soon as he got into the phone, got to the phone. Oh, gee, he stopped abruptly. How are you? He asked in his actor's voice. I could tell he was afraid of people at his phone key at his phone kiosk were listening. Mom asked, to, asked me to call you. Sorry. Mom asked me to call to, to wish you happy new year and to ask about things at work, about dad and all. He was so guarded that I wanted to be vague too. Yesterday at the meeting, they mentioned his name. He's stubborn, you know. He wouldn't talk about radio or establishing ties, so they lost patience. He, I've got to go. Bye. He hung up. 